gentlemen. Joining us now is a, a friend of the show. He's come on a couple times and, and honestly, one of my favorite people to talk to, especially when it comes to the world of March Madness. And it starts tonight. Like we're, we're upon the first four. So not, not a better time in the world to bring on a guy who's been covering and, and honestly, he's retired now, but watches college basketball. I had to make sure I got him on when there wasn't any games going on. So I couldn't distract him. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Bacosi joins the show. Bob, how's it going, brother? I'm good, Chad. How are you? Nice nice to be back on. Thanks for the invitation. Hey, man, it's always a pleasure. I've been well uh, and, and doing really well because, you know what, the, the sun's out a little longer now. I feel like we're uh, getting close to spring. And normally baseball and spring training makes me feel like we're close to spring. But we didn't quite have that happen the same way. But March Madness is here, so yep. I feel like we're turning the corner uh, but before we get into to the NCAA and, and everything going on there, just wanted to kind of ask, it's been a unique time in the world of Major League Baseball and then NFL free agency. I've barely had time to really dive into March Madness yet because there's been so much stuff going on. Have you been paying attention to anything out there as far as the, the world of baseball and football go right now? I have, although it's kind of the opposite for me. Baseball is my favorite sport, and I'm sure always will be. But I'm perfectly... You know, I didn't miss spring training. And to tell you the truth, I didn't spend much time reading about the labor issues because number one, frankly, they bore me. You know, <laughs> the issues themselves bore me. I'm not, I'm not really interested in them. Uh, but I wasn't concerned about, you know, the season starting late because I'm just, you know, ankle, hip, you know, elbows deep into the college basketball season and the NBA season. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge Boston Celtics fan. I watch every game, but yeah, of course I've been paying to the other stuff. Uh, and of course uh, in baseball, it's happening now and will continue to happen. I imagine at breakneck speed because they had that, the, you know, the lockout prevented them from doing any transactions. So now I think you're going to see teams scrambling to make the uh, improvements that they normally would make over an entire off season and, and to try to make them in the span of a couple of weeks. Yeah. It's been rapid fire for sure. And then the, the NFL on top of that changed uh, where that you can do the early tampering, I guess is what they call it now. So I think uh, I counted like 37 signings yesterday or something. So like it, it's been just breakneck pace and uh Baseball, you know, we, we I'm still waiting on the Freddie Freeman shoe to drop. That's the one I'm really watching. And uh, a buddy of mine that hosts the show with us, diehard Braves fan. So he was fine if the lockout continued for a while just because it meant the Braves are still world champions for a little longer. But uh, they uh, signed Max Olsen, moved real quick. But uh, now I'm just curious to see where uh, Freddie goes. He's 32 years old. But, man, he's a, he's an icon in, in today's game of baseball. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I heard the Red Sox are kind of interested in uh, Freddie. So we'll see what happens there. I, I heard that. And I would like to, you know, I'm a Yankee fan. I'd like to think the Yankees are, he is, the Yankees have a lot of needs. He is exactly what they need. Yeah. They really don't have, uh, they're not comfortable with their situation at first base, you know, with Luke Voigt who gets injured a lot and hasn't been very consistent. And, uh, you know, DJ LeMay, you can play first base, but that's not why they got him. And he's sort of a, you know, a, a guy that can play second, third, and first. And the Yankees are really into these uh, saber metrics, which say that you get the most out of your players when you rest them regularly. So LeMay, you will get all the at-bats they want him to get without playing first base every day. So, and, and then, but Freeman is a great player and he's left-handed. Yeah. The Yankees have a dearth of left hand. Their, their lineup last year was so out of balance and it makes no sense in that ballpark. You know, I mean, you know, ever since the original Yankee stadium, it's been a left-handed hitters dream with that short porch in right field. So he would, plus he's a great team guy. He would fill a lot of blanks. I just don't know if they have the appetite financially to spend what it's going to take to get him to outspend for, you know, specifically the Dodgers, but he would be a huge plus for the Yankees. And if the Red Sox got him, you know, that would be a double blow for the Yankees because they don't have him. And then, you know, the guys they try to beat all the time uh, have him. So I, I hope that does not happen. I'm, I'm sorry to see that the Braves that didn't work it out, work it out in Atlanta. Cause he, he's the kind of guy that I think, you'd like to see stay with the same franchise his whole career, but you know, in major league baseball, 
that kind of thing just doesn't happen anymore. No, it's hard for almost any sport, but uh, he's been the face of that franchise for at least 10 years. So, yeah, it, it is kind of sad to see him go, but now it's interesting to watch uh, how the chips fall and everything else. But, you know, so exciting time when we talk about sports, a lot of different stuff going on. I got to ask you real quick before we jump into the tournament, your Celtics, like what kind of tear have they been on? I mean, that's been re- – I, I came out of nowhere. That's been amazing to watch. I give all the credit to M.A. Udoka because he stayed the course. You know, they were playing very poorly. Um, you know, there are a lot of isolate. I mean, the NBA is largely an isolation league, but they were just too much with the isolation. They have two brilliant offensive talents in Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, but it wasn't working well. Plus, they had a lot of injuries. But, you know, they, they finally clicked and, and they've stayed healthy during this stretch. And he's had the same starting five game after game after game. And uh, they're not deep at all. You know, they, at the trading deadline, you know, they picked up uh, Derek White and they picked up Daniel Tice. But to tell you the truth, uh, Udoka in a close game goes with an eight-man rotation and, and, and Tice is not one of the eight. Um, so they, uh, you know, the back end of their roster is abysmal. <laughs> yeah. So if they, you know, if and when they have other injuries, they're going to have a real issue. But uh no, I like the way they're playing. They kind of gave one away on Sunday. And, uh, you know, they start a West Coast trip tomorrow night and they play against the Warriors. And I'm sure you know Draymond Green came back last night. Yeah. And he makes all the difference in the world for the Warriors uh, in so many ways. But no, the, the Celtics are playing great. And it's a little scary when you look at the when you look at the loss column. The Celtics, before they lost on Sunday, they're only three games behind Miami in the loss column. So now they're four behind and they're there are two behind, only two behind Philly and only one behind Chicago and only one behind Milwaukee. So that Eastern Conference is frenzied. Now, all those teams, you know, the top five are all lumped together. And I really think that uh, any one of those five could come out of the East. Oh, yeah. I think, I think Chicago, in my mind, is the least likely to come out. and They're just not playing well. But, uh, you know, you look at the West, I mean, there are a load. I had a chance to go to the Celtics-Grizzlies game. I think it was on March 3rd uh, up in Boston. And that was great, you know, to get a chance to see Dra Moran play. And, and uh, Moran played well, and uh, and so did Tatum. It was, it was quite a show. Uh, I mean, that, that's must-see you know, basketball right there. Just those two guys alone, like, that's that's what the NBA needs is this next, you know, wave of stars to come in and just kind of take the stranglehold because that, that last uh, wave is kind of fading out. LeBron's that last one still hanging on, but uh, the Lakers, they may not even make the playoffs. So who knows? They're a hot mess. Yeah, they they are. are a hot mess. And, uh, you know, uh, I thought, you know, when they got Anthony Davis, that was going to make Well, I mean, they, they did win a title, you know, let's give them yep. credit for that. But it, it is astonishing to see how they, they, I think with their loss last night, aren't they 10 games under 500? Uh, at least I, I know they're only one game out of being one or two games out of being in the play. So like they could, yeah, they, they, they have could, New Orleans breathing down their neck and there's a, there's a pretty good gap between them and the Clippers who are, are ahead of them and a huge gap uh, to the next team, Minnesota, that's playing out of its mind. You know, Carl Anthony Towns had an unbelievable game last night. I, I saw uh, that. But, but yeah, but I mean the West, the West, you know, the West clearly has the two best teams in the league and, you know, and they might have the three, three best teams in the league, uh, uh, you know, with Memphis also. I, I, yeah. They're ahead of schedule for sure. Uh, so when we talk about best teams, let's, let's go ahead and dive into the tournament here a little bit. Uh, you know, the number one overall seed, uh, you kind of came down to Gonzaga in Arizona. Did the committee get it right? Who do you think is the top team coming in after the season's done? Well, based on the resume, Gonzaga is. Uh, I don't think Gonzaga is the best team in the country, but they have the best resume. So, yeah, I think they got it right in picking them as the number one seed. I didn't have any problems with the uh, with the four teams that they picked for number one. I think there was, you know, I think there's a gap between uh, the fourth number one, I guess you would say Baylor's the fourth number one, and, and the twos. Um, I did have a problem with some of the seedings. I think Tennessee is under-seeded. At number three, I think Iowa is really underseated at number five. But uh, I mean, I, you know, it's funny. Everyone is so quick to criticize the committee. And the same thing happened during the football season with the people oh, know, yeah. with, with the, the college football playoff selection committee. Uh, I mean, these, you know, these, the people that are on these committees, 
they read everything. They inhale all the numbers. They watch all the games. They really, they try to measure everything. And uh, in basketball, it's really hard because, you know, you have, it's not only who are the ones or who are the number twos, but then where do you, where do you put the best <laughs> two? Do you put it in the region with the worst one? Same thing happened on the women's side. I mean, I'm sure North Carolina State fans are very upset that uh, in their region at number two is UConn playing about uh, 80 miles from their campus and the, the arena in Bridgeport will be loaded with UConn fans, but it, they have a tough job. So on balance, I, I don't think they got much wrong, but I, I would have seated Tennessee. I would have moved them one line higher and I would have, uh, I would have moved Iowa one line higher. I, that's not, that's not bad. If that's the, the only ones that you're really seeing as outliers, which really they're not crazy outliers. Like you said, they do a pretty good job and, you know, with basketball, there's, you know, 25 plus games that you're trying to observe. And, and there's, it's not like football where you're only looking in, in college aspect, four to eight teams, maybe here it, it's, they were coming down to the, what was it? I think it was um, Richmond and Davidson, you know, that, that hinged so much on like who the first four or last four in were going to be. And yes. it was, it was just, uh, you know, they're, 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 it was a great game too. I watched that game. I I'll tell you what, Chad. I love Champ Week. Oh yeah. I love Champ Week almost as much as I love the NCAA tournament. And my favorite day of the year is that last Saturday, where there are 15 championship games, and then I think there were 10 semifinals. You know, in five different leagues. And I, you know, I'm a I'm certifiable. I have three TVs in my family <laughs> room, and I'm just constantly switching. And so I, I can honestly tell you. I watched some or all of all of those uh, 21 games on Saturday, but, uh, and on Sunday, you know, there were only five of them, but that Richmond Davidson game was one of the best games of the, of the tournament. Uh, but I think in hindsight, I think that, I think the committee uh, puts less and less of an emphasis on what happens in the conference tournaments uh, much more so than they used to. I think that's pretty right. obvious with the seeding of Tennessee and Iowa and uh, Jay Bill is actually, uh, you know, who knows a lot more about this than I do. He thinks what they should do is they shouldn't release it, but they should have, they should see the tournament before champ week and then just make adjustments for the teams that get uh, automatic qualifier bids that wouldn't get at large bids. And, uh, you know, instead of, you know, all that movement around, because uh, I mean, it is look, the, what happens in the regular season is more, a more accurate measure than what happens. And, you know, when you have to, you know, champ week is something that, that never happens during the season. I mean, you have a bunch of those tournaments around Thanksgiving, you know, where there, you know, there are eight teams. So you play three days in a row, but that's the only time in the year you do it. And then all of a sudden the conference tournament, the good teams play three days in a row and the teams at the bottom, the standings play four or even five days in a row. Right. And it's, it's, it's completely different. I mean, the same thing would happen in the NBA. I mean, if, it, if, if everyone, if everyone had to play, nobody ever plays three days in a row in the NBA, you know, you, you wind up with a different result. So I think the, the, the far gr uh, more accurate barometer is your body of work over, a, you know, a 27 or whatever it is, it, whatever it is, regular game season. No, I mean, you're right. And, and there is such a gap between November and March, you know, as far as how that goes. And, uh, you know, I'm with you, though, the, the conference um, championship week. Uh, and, and I know you spent a lot of your career covering games like that. And, and obviously, you know, that's going to rub you a certain way to, to always get you lured in because you got to see the magic there. But, yeah, you we're watching schools that I would never normally tune in for. And like you said, just referencing the Davidson Richmond game, like th there's schools that are just having these phenomenal, phenomenal matchups. And you get the buzzer beaters and things like that all the time. And it's just, you know, these kids, that's a lot of these schools, that's their championship. You know, they get to go to March Madness, but just being able to win like the MEAC or something like that, like that's, right. that's their apex. Yeah. Um, and I, and I'll tell you what, one of the things I really enjoyed and keep in mind, I live only about uh, 17 miles from the Yale campus. Um, you know, Yale won the Ivy league tournament over the weekend and, and, and keep in mind that, you know, like the Ivy League was the first ones to shut it down two years ago, and then they didn't play last year. So these Yale kids that won the conference tournament and are going to the NCAA tournament, they didn't have an opportunity. They didn't even have the opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament the last two years. And in the Ivy League, they don't allow red shirts. So you don't get one of those years back. So these kids, you know, they only get four years to play. And so in 50% of those four years, they had no opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament. Same thing on the women's side. 
the Princeton women had a great season. And I know their coach, Carla Berube, because she played at UConn when I did UConn games. And um, to see the joy on the kids' faces when those, those I mean, it, it happens in every league, Virginia Tech, they never won it before, you know. It was, you know, euphoria, but to see, just to see the sheer joy on the kids' faces when they win uh, and they get to go to the NCAA tournament, which is something they've dreamt of playing in their whole lives, is, is just, it's great theater. Yeah, and, you know, I, I never thought about that when it comes to the Ivy League, but you're absolutely right when it comes to, they're, they're under a little bit different set of rules there. And then you mentioned Virginia Tech and the, the, the wave of emotion that they rode through that conference tournament was uh, was pretty amazing. I'm going to ask a little bit more about uh, some of that here in a second. But just when you, if you've had a chance to kind of dive into the bracket, is there anybody that you look at that you're like, they have a really good path? You feel like they might have a, a easier road? Is there anybody that stands out as maybe having just the more favorable matchups? I don't know about easier road, but I personally think Arizona is the best team in the country. Okay. After, after watching them play all season and particularly watching them play uh, the way they played against UCLA the other night, the Pac-12 championship game, Arizona is my pick to win the whole thing. And, I'm, I, you know, I'm a, as you know, I'm a Seton Hall. I, I know Hall. that's second round matchup, maybe. <laughs> if Seton Hall gets, is fortunate enough to get past TCU and that's a big if on Friday, they have Arizona waiting and, you know, stranger things that have, have happened. And I, 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 I attended five Seton Hall games this year, and I watched every other one on TV, every second of every game. Uh, and, you know, they, they've had their moments and whatnot. And like all teams, they have their flaws. I just cannot imagine the scenario where they could beat Arizona. I just can't imagine the scenario. So I, my, my pick is Arizona to win the whole thing. Uh, you know, I'm not going to pick all four number one seeds to go. In fact, I, I got Auburn and Purdue going to the final along with Gonzaga. Uh, you know, you're not the only one that's real high on Purdue. I've heard a lot of the talking heads talk about Purdue a lot. And then honestly, just watching Auburn this year, like they're, they're super talented. And the, I, I think people may have not been paying attention to how good SEC basketball has gotten. And, and it seems like it's happened fairly quickly. Like it used to be just, Kentucky and then maybe you would have a Tennessee pop up every now and then but like top to bottom that conference has gotten a lot better they are they they uh, of the of the power five and really really in basketball it's a power six because you have to throw the big east in there with the yeah. others um they are the most improved conference in the country over the last couple of years and I think um I was going to say they're the deepest but boy the big Ten's pretty deep too um, but yeah, I think, I think if I, if you, you know, you held a gun to my head, I, I would say, I think the SEC is the best conference in the country this year. And, uh, I think they have the, probably the, the most great athletes of all the conferences, you know, the big 10 still yeah. is, you know, kind of bruiser, yeah. bruiser type basketball, but the SEC, the athletes they have, uh, you know, some of the programs have, have at least caught up to Kentucky. And, uh, so Kentucky is, it's not even close to being a lock to be the best team in that league anymore. So I look at it like this. I think the SEC is the best of the top, like you said, with the athletes. The Big Ten is probably the, the, the deepest. And then I'd say the Big 12 is probably the one that has the most competitive from top to bottom without having too much of a drop off. Yeah, the, the big, yeah, it's just that league is so different than the others because it only has 10 teams, you yeah. know, instead of everybody four. plays. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hope, I hope TCU is not that tough on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. We'll find yeah. out. Uh, so uh, you're, I, I appreciate the prognostication there on, on the teams you feel like uh, have the most promise, uh, but there's a, a two seed I wanted to talk about because we, we are losing an icon in the sport with uh, coach K and uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not a Duke fan, but, you know, if, if you can't recognize and respect the the impact that that guy has had just in the sport of basketball in general, not just college, but just in the sport in general, I felt bad that he didn't get the uh, win on senior night and all that, but uh, his, his final uh, home game. But how does this tournament look for Duke? And then if you just had to, if you had to tell your, your grandchildren about Coach K, what would you say about him? Uh, I think that Duke, um, 
you know, they have a shot. I don't love their chances of getting to the final four. Um, I don't like their chances of beating a Zag if they get that far. I just, I just, you know, losing that game at home to North Carolina and then losing in the ACC championship game, uh, I, that something tells me that they're, they're going to hit a pothole along the way. And I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly who's going to beat them. Uh, but, um, I don't think, I think, I think Duke is going to lose before they get to the elite eight. So I don't like their chances to win the whole thing. I don't, uh, but coach K, um, you know, Chad, the more successful you are, it's probably true in all, uh, professions, but particularly in sports with the media coverage, it gets, it seems like the more uh, people there are who want to take you down and want to take shots at you and want to criticize you, uh, certainly I, I don't know that Duke has the most fans in the country, but I think Duke's the most hated team in the country. Uh, Notre Dame football, and I'm a Notre Dame fan, I think is probably the most hated team in the country and also might have the most fans in the country. Uh, you know, my Yankees haven't won since 2009, but they remain the most hated franchise. And, and even though the Cowboys haven't won since 1995, and they probably have the most fans in the country, and they're definitely have the most uh, detractors. Yep. Same thing with announcers, you know, I mean, the more exposure guys like uh, Joe Buck and uh, and Jim Nance get the more people want to just take shots at them and whatnot. And I, I've seen, you know, I, I probably spend too much time on social media, but some of the criticism of Mike Krzyzewski is just, is just off the charts. Uh, I think it was shameful that the university of North Carolina didn't do anything to honor him when he coached his last game at the Smith center. I believe every other team in the ACC did. I mean, that is just so petty for them to do that. But uh, what will I tell my uh, kid, uh, grandchildren, if I ever, if I ever have them, um, about Mike Shashevsky? I would probably choose one story. And as you know, I worked for years doing the sports updates on Mike and Mike and Morning on ESPN Radio. Right. So Mike Greenberg grew up in Greenwich Village, and he has a younger brother, just one sibling, and they had were friends with two other brothers who lived in Greenwich Village, and. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was the older or the younger, but I think the younger of the two brothers in the other family lost his life in the World Trade Center. And the older brother was his, went to Duke and was a manager of the basketball team at Duke. So uh, Mike and his brother went to sit Shiva in the apartment of the family when they lost their, when they lost their son uh, after 9-11. And uh, they were in the living room for quite a while and there was no sign of the mother. And so Greeny asked, you know, where's your mom? He said, oh, she's, she's on the phone. She'll, she'll be out in a second. And about 20 minutes later, she came out and she was all uh, red faced and her eyes were very red. And Greeny found out that when Mike Krzyzewski found out that the younger brother of a former manager lost his life, he called his former manager to console him. And after he talked to him, he said, is there any possibility you can put your mom on the phone? I'd like to talk to her. And he had only met this young man's mom once because, as you know, managers, student managers are also honored on senior night at their right. respective school. So he met the young man's parents on senior night and he spent 20 minutes on the phone with her, just trying to console her. And uh, I understand he does stuff like that all the time. And the only reason I know it is because Mike Greenberg was there to witness it. And he told me. Right. I mean, there wasn't any media coverage for it. You know, nobody at Duke made the announcement. I mean, Shashevsky's greatest critics think he's somehow this egomaniac and a publicity hound. Well, I mean, that doesn't, that's not consistent with that story, is it? I just think that he's someone who realizes uh, that he has a bully pulpit and that he can say things which have an impact. Uh, and he does. And I admire him for that. And so I have nothing but admiration for him. I did three Duke games in my life. One of them when I was a young pup and Coach K wasn't a much older pup than I. He was the coach at Army, and I was doing Fairfield University basketball on the radio in the mid-70s, and I always used to interview both coaches separately pregame, basically sitting in the stands with a cassette recorder. That's what we're talking about, technology. And I met him then, and then I did. I was fortunate enough to do one game at Cameron Indoor, and then I also did a Duke game at the uh, Mohegan Sun Arena here in Connecticut. And... Um, you know, he's West Point through and through. 
when he's when you're introduced to him, he practically brings you to your knees with his handshake. And as he's talking to you, he's looking right in your eyes while he's talking and while you're talking back. So he's West Point from top to bottom, and he has a reverence for his alma mater. And uh, I think the probably the greatest barometer of any college coach is what his former players think of him and his former players revere him. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, I'm close to Jim Calhoun for my time here in Connecticut. And uh, not, of, not all of Jim's players loved him while they played for him, but after they got away from him and they realized they had some perspective and they got a better feel for, you know, why he did what he did, why he pushed me so hard. Uh, and I think it's the same thing with Coach Krzyzewski. I mean, I've, I've, I know a number of guys who played for him. You know, I've done games with a number of guys who play for him and I have the utmost respect for him. So, uh, you know, he certainly belongs on the Mount Rushmore of college basketball coaches. And um, if Mount Rushmore only had one head, uh, as much as I respect John Wooden and I revere John Wooden, I think I think Mike Krzyzewski has to be considered the, the greatest college basketball coach in, uh, in the history of the game. See, this is why you're such a good interview, Bob, is because you answer my questions before I even ask them, you know. And, and like, I know everyone wants to get into the – you know, legacy debate with him and Wooden. And, you know, that's fine. That's what talking heads do. But, you know, the era that Coach K did it in, you know, not not taking anything away from Wooden, but like he, it's just amazing with the level of competitiveness that has increased in the NCAA. Like we see it now all the time when it comes to the tournament. Like we know who Florida Gulf Coast is now, you know. I mean, there's, there's right. just a different level to the way the game is. But, I look at Coach K, and obviously I'm I'm in my forties, so I look at him as as like the Mount Rushmore to me, right? Because he's all I've known when it comes to the pinnacle of success in in college basketball. And uh, I think when guys like you mentioned Jim Calhoun, he's not coaching uh, at major level. I, think, I don't know if he's still coaching at all. No, he's uh, not. He, he he resigned right at the beginning of the season. Okay, uh, but you know you got. Sorry, right. You got Bayham that's uh, probably done once his uh, kids uh, are done playing, I would imagine. Uh, well, he said he's going to be back next year. Uh, I is He's got two kids playing for him, right? Yes. Are they, they're not both seniors, are they? Uh, I, th I think, I think Jimmy might have one year back. Okay. I, I, I'm thinking he's just, he's going to get through them and then we'll see what happens. But um, outside of that, like you got a, a younger wave of coaches, but like, uh, I mean, maybe Bill Self with his winning percentage, he's rocking out there in Kansas. Like that's just a, a well-oiled machine, but it's still not coach K and, and maybe we'll get someone that rises to that level. But I think, uh, people may not appreciate just how impactful he is. And then like on USA basketball and the things he did there, I mean, that he, he resuscitated that program. Uh, which, which, you know, it, it takes a certain guy to be able to do that at the point it was at. And for a college coach to do it, for a college coach to earn the instant respect from all the NBA players was enormous. Uh, you know, in the, uh, in the most recent issue of Sports Illustrated, Coach K is on the cover and there were two stories in there. And one of them was about his days at Duke. And one of them was about his, his experience with USA basketball. It was written by Ian O'Connor, who has been the author of countless books and, and now as a columnist for the New York Post and I'm and I, uh, very familiar with his work and I think he's brilliant and it's a great story you read about how he probably like he told the story about how they played in an exhibition game and Kobe took some really bad shots and missed and it kind of took took them out of their flow and of course on that team you know unlike uh, like we were talking about the Celtics before you know if Jason Tatum has a bad night you know Celtics might not win but, you know, at, at that team, the Olympic team, there's so many great players. You think of last the Olympics last summer, and I watched every minute of every game, you know, down the stretch, like Damian Lillard wasn't in the game because he wasn't <laughs> good enough to be in the game at the end. That's how great they were. And so uh, he took some bad shots and he felt, well, I, I need to address it. He may be Kobe Bryant, but, you know, I'm the coach of the team. And so he was trying to figure out how to do it. And he, uh, and the next day he said, Kobe, you got a minute. And he called him into a, an office and he had a laptop and he strung together a couple of shots. And then he said, uh, what do you think about that shot? And, and, you know, and you see how you kind of 
took us out of the flow and it took us several minutes to get back and whatnot. And uh, he kind of held his breath and Kobe looked at it. He says, you're right, coach. Got it. Sorry. Won't happen again. <laughs> Which, oh, that's, an, that's an amazing story. It's one of my favorites too, but like, just you talk about the type of alpha that Kobe was, you know, and, and they, they, res, they respect coach K and yeah, he did a, he did a phenomenal job with those teams. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, you know, it would, it would be great uh, to see Duke win the whole thing because of that. It would be an unbelievable story. You know, Coach K coached for 42 years in one place. First of all, how many times has that happened in the history of the game? You know, Bayheim is, is, is another example of it. Uh, and, you know, Coach Wooden just didn't coach that long. And so it's not fair to compare, you know, I mean, Coach Wooden won 11 and K won five. And as you said, it's harder to win today. But he just did it over 42 years and it was more difficult. It doesn't take anything away from Coach Wooden. You know, I guess, it, yes, it's harder to win it today. But that doesn't mean it was easy to win it back when he did. Because I always say, well, if it was so easy to win it, <laughs> how come they're the only ones that won? Right. You know, people would say that about my Celtics you know, who won 11 in 13 years. Yeah, but it was easy back then. Well, if it was so easy. How come nobody else ever, like, won one, you know? You know, same thing with Babe Ruth, you know? Oh, the pitchers were lousy. Oh, uh, yeah, so I guess it was easier to hit a home run. How come no one else hit home runs? Only one guy hit home runs. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, Wood, Wooden was great, but but Coach K did it much longer, much, much longer. So I think, um, I think I'd give him the slight edge, the slight edge. The uh, yeah, The thing I always say is, yeah, we might say it's easy. It's just easy for them, you know, and, and they're going to tell you it's not easy. They, they obviously work their tail off to get where they're at in all those regards you mentioned. Uh, the last thing I, I'm, I'm going to say, though, I, I will, uh, for me, as long as I live, I don't know if another moment will, will beat this when it comes to March Madness, but I just wanted to get your opinion. Is the Leitner shot the greatest moment in March Madness history, or do you have something else? Um. I would say no, because it only happened in an Elite Eight game. I, I, I understand you, that. I understand I'll that. I'll tell you, Dad, the thing that got me hooked on college basketball was, uh, so I'm 70 years old. Are so you going to hit first, me with Valvano? Is that what you got? No. Oh, okay. Way back. For, way back. Okay. Um, the first NCAA tournament I ever watched, first Final Four I ever watched, was in 1963. And Cincinnati was trying to become the first school to win three in a row. It had never happened. And, and by the way, it's only happened once since, and UCLA not only won three in a row, they won seven in a row. <laughs> so you look at it, it's seven, and then the next longest streak is two by a whole bunch of teams. Um, but Cincinnati was the heavy favorite to win three in a row. And in the uh, semifinals, they beat Oregon State and uh, Loyola of Chicago beat Duke. First time Duke ever went to the Final Four in the semis. And back then, it was Friday night, Saturday night. And so Saturday night, I'm listening. I'm living in uh, Ellicott City, Maryland, the suburb of Baltimore, and I'm listening to the game on WHAS at Louisville, which is, has a tremendous signal. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> and um, and I discovered at halftime, uh, listening to the game on the radio, that the game was on TV, and it was nationally televised, but wasn't on network TV. It was on syndicated, syndicated uh, nationally. And it was on an hour tape delay. That's how insignificant the NCAA tournament was. So I turned off the radio and turned it on and then watched the first half that I had already listened to. And then obviously watched the second half. It went into overtime and Loyola Chicago beat Cincinnati 60 to 58 on a tip in at the buzzer by a guy named Vic Rouse, R-O-U-S-E. So I don't know how anything can top that. I don't know how you can score a shot at the buzzer in the championship game and have anything that happened two rounds earlier in the elite eight eclipse that. Of course, we didn't have the same audience <laughs> that we had in 92 and it wasn't Duke versus Kentucky. Uh, but that, yeah, that was an incredible play, but so was, uh, so was the Bryce drew play. Oh, yeah. that, oh, you know, that unbelievable play. And so was the Chris Jenkins shot for Villanova to beat Carolina in the championship game in 2016. 
that was a shot at the buzzer also. And yeah, the, I try not to have recency bias on that one because I feel like it's so so new. But yeah, that's that's up there in the world of epic uh, ends of games for sure. And like you said, it's it's when it happened too. It's it's right. it, for the title. Uh, the thing I will say, the last few years, uh, I feel like by the time we get to the final four, usually that title game, we've had some some great games over the last few years. It's not been blowouts or anything. It's been yeah. like the competitive nature of these, like the tournament works. Like we get awesome yeah. matchups. How about the semifinal last year between Gonzaga and UCLA? Oh, and UCLA, you know, they got all those guys back. Like, I'm not going to sleep on them this year. They they could make a run. I think they're a four seed without looking. Uh, yeah. But the uh, UCLA wasn't supposed to be there. Like, they, right. they, had, they had no business in, in that at all. And uh, that's that's what's great. And that's um, one of the, the – probably my favorite thing about March Madness is you can't predict any of this. Whoever the hottest team was coming in – you know, they could get bounced in the first or second round. Uh, you yeah. could you could have a team that goes on a tear in the conference tournament and still don't do anything. And then you can have a team that limps in as a seven seed and, and watch them go to the final four. Like, it's just amazing. And you can't. UConn, UConn in 2011, you know, they I, had a, exactly. five games and five nights at the Big East just to get into the tournament. And Were they a they, 10 seed that year? And they, I forget, and then they won, and then they won six more, you know, so that, you know, that's one of the all time runs. Mm. Well, I, you know, I could talk all day about uh, March Madness with you, Bob, but you gave me a half hour of your time. And I think you're going to head out to Florida, aren't you? Or are you already there? I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, no, next week, uh, there are uh, three of my Seton Hall buddies and I, uh, for about the last 10, 12 years, we get together uh, each year, we go somewhere at, at a beach somewhere along the Atlantic Ocean, and we we mix it up. And when we get together uh, at the get together, we decide where and when we're going to meet again. Well, because of the pandemic, we haven't been together since we were at the Outer Banks. Uh, it'll be two years this May, two years ago when we went. No, actually three years uh, that we haven't gotten together. So we're getting together next week in Florida. One of my buddies lives down there. So yeah, I'm on a plane first thing uh, Monday morning. One of one of the other guys that's coming with me. Is is actually flying with me, and uh, and I told him I told him that we have to leave for the airport at four fifteen a.m. on Monday, <laughs> which of course was my life for twenty years doing right. play by play, you know, you know, leaving, and so he said, "Why?" <laughs> so yeah, we're we're really looking forward to that. But I scheduled the trip. I scheduled the trip around the NCAA tournament, so that uh, you know I didn't I wouldn't leave this Sunday because you know Sunday there are eight games. But there's nothing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then our last night in Florida, you know, we'll watch the first night of the Sweet 16. And then we're flying home early Friday so I can be back in front of my TV to watch the next night of the Sweet 16. See, I love how pragmatic you are. You got it all planned out. And you well, my, wife, my, wife, my wife uses a different word, certifiable. <laughs> Well, you know, to each your own, you know, it's, it's all a matter of opinion. So uh, I got to ask you this. Uh, it's the middle of March and we had a snow squall move through the mid-Atlantic. Did you guys get hit up there in Connecticut? Uh, no, we didn't. We didn't. No, we, we, it's been a very cold winter. You know, I, I, ha, I have, we have a dog and I, I walk him first thing every morning and uh, I can't count how many mornings that the wind chill was uh, either below 10 or sometimes a couple degrees below zero. And I mean, he's got a fur coat. It would take me 10 minutes to put on all my clothes and boots to walk <laughs> them. You know, I, we walked for a mile each one. And I don't ever remember that. I don't ever remember a winter having so many cold days. But to tell you the truth, we did not get hit with a lot of snow this winter. We really didn't. Well, and either that's, either that's way, okay. you got to be looking forward to Florida. That's okay with me. I love I love snow on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. It's pretty. Other than that, you can have it. Uh, well, like I said, one of my favorite things about this time of year is spring training, which we didn't get. March Madness, at least it's here. Makes me feel like warmer days are ahead. Hopefully yes. you have a wonderful time in Florida. And Bob, thanks so much for coming on the show again, man. And, and uh, you know, if uh, your Yankees are doing well, maybe we'll catch up sometime this summer and we can talk some baseball. Maybe they'll have a, a new first baseman. Who knows? I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. Sounds like a deal. Thank you. All right, Bob. Have a good one, buddy. Same to you.